want to thank Hillary's great friend and my great friend, Dolores Huerta. I, I want to say that her whole life is a lesson in what it takes to lift people up. She is 86 years young, and she's still out here fighting for the education of young people and for the rights of labor people and for the future of our country. I want to thank the Stockton Mayor, Mayor Silva, thank you for being here. Vice Mayor Fugazi, thank you. The Lathrop Mayor, Sonny Dollywall, thank you for being here. I want to thank the NAACP President, Bobby Bivens, Council Member Susan Loftus, the previous speakers, thank you very much. Councilman Dan Wright, Supervisor Moses Upping, San Joaquin Pride Center Director Nicholas Haddon, thank you very much. Thank you to the ASME Political and Legislative Director Brian Allison. Thank you to our great friend, the President of the United Farm Workers, Arturo Rodriguez. Assembly Member Susan Eggman, thank you. And I want to thank Dimitri Sakanazo, who is a student at the University of San Francisco because he represents the future we're all fighting for. Look, this is a, an interesting election. It's coming down to California. When I was elected president, I was nominated but did not clearly have the votes I needed to win on the first ballot until the last election day, which then was June 2nd, not June 7th. It was in California and New Jersey. I ask you to do for Hillary what California did for me then. Send her into that convention with a wind at her back. With a United Democratic Party. It's a force of progress united. We need all of you to vote, as many absentee and advance as possible are on Election Day, and get your friends to go. Look, the stakes here are very high. All you got to do is look at the protesters outside to know what the difference in us and them is. We are intelligent! This is a huge election that will shape our future for decades to come. Do we believe that we can grow together and rise together? Or do we really think we can go back to a past America to elevate one social group over another and divide the pie differently? Hillary believes we have to grow this economy and take everybody along for the ride. Do we believe that our diversity is a strength which enables us all to flourish or do we believe it's a weakness and therefore walls are better than bridges? Hillary is the bridge candidate and she wants you to walk across that bridge with her. Look, you know, I, I have to tell you, I, I've, I've watched her now for 45 years make good things happen. She was only in elected office for 12 years or, or elected or appointed. She was a Senator for eight years, the Secretary of State for four, but for 40 years she's been making things happen for other people. She was in it. When, I, when we were in law school, she went to South Texas to register Mexican-American voters that had been shut out of the political system for decades. When she got out of law school, she turned down all these fancy law firms and went to work for the Children's Defense Fund and went to South Carolina and Alabama in South Carolina to keep African-American teenagers out of prison with adults so they wouldn't have their lives ruined, and they got that done, and in Alabama to expose the continuation of illegal segregated public education under the guise of tax-exempt private academies. She had, when she was only 26, 27 years old, 
a lot of guts. She went in and pretended to be a White House wife who wanted to put her kid in a segregated school, <laughs> all alone in a little town in northern Alabama. Do what it takes. And she said, look, just cut to the chase here. If I put my boy in this school, will my child be in an all-white school or not, yes or no? And when the guy said, absolutely, she had him. They lost their tax credits. They lost their segregated status parade in the group. She changed the future before she was 30. She had been doing this all her life. And so there are three reasons you ought to be for her, besides the fact that she's a great change maker. One is she's got the best ideas to allow us to grow together, to rise together. With rising incomes, stronger middle class lines, upward mobility, downward inequality. Two is she's the only person you can vote for who's actually ever done anything to break the partisan gridlock in Washington and get things done. Three is, especially since the Republicans have made their choice, she is the only person you can vote for that you know can keep us safe around the world and give us the space to grow. There are a lot of troubles in this world today. And we need someone who is respected, who is knowledgeable, who is able to keep big, bad things from happening to us and give us the space we need to grow this economy and lead the world away from all this crazy division that's dividing us. So if you believe that, if you believe that the Nash administration has an obligation to invest in jobs that will be good for the long term in America, a modern infrastructure, making us the clean energy superpower of the world, bringing back manufacturing jobs, getting loans out there to small business really aggressively for the first time in eight years, and investing in science and technology so we can keep leading the world when all these young people are having their children. Hillary's your candidate. If you believe, if you believe that we should go through another round of tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, add, trillion, add trillions of dollars to the national debt, and abolish the Dodd-Frank law, which keeps Wall Street from ever wrecking Main Street again, then you got another choice over there. Hillary will give you the best economy. An economy of shared prosperity. Look. Anybody who's kept up with this knows that from the work that we tried to do to help President Obama starting when he won the primary, won the nomination, and then in 2012 when I had the honor to speak for him at the Democratic Convention, we think he's done a better job than his critics give him credit for on this economy. But it takes a long time to get over the kind of financial crash we had. People are so angry because eight and ten Americans have not gotten a pay raise after inflation since the crash. You can now, but you better do the right thing. Right. You can now. If we grow this economy from the middle out and the bottom up like we did when I was president, we can all rise together. Yeah. But you got to vote for Hillary. The second thing I want to say is, if you want us to all rise together, we got to fight income inequality. She favors the Buffett rule. Now, look at this. You talk about the difference in two candidates. She thinks that everybody who has an income of a million dollars a year or more, from whatever source, should pay a minimum of 30 percent of their income in taxes. She has released more than two decades of our tax returns, and since we left the White House, we've averaged 40 percent of our income in taxes. And her opponent, who never tires of telling us how much richer he is than the rest of us, won't release his tax returns. Do you really think he's going to be a force for raising working people's incomes? We got to do this together. We also have to recognize that the biggest threat to inequality today is billionaires and hedge fund managers 
who are forcing these companies to run their stock up every year so they can sell it in a year and a day and make a lower capital gains tax rate. When the best companies make money over a three to five to seven year time horizon. So Hillary says, let's give a big carrot and a big stick for good behavior. <laughs> let's give these companies that fairly share their profits with their employees and their communities a 15% tax credit for sharing with the people who made the company rich in the first place. And let's not give the whole reduction from 35 to 20 percent for holding the stock for a year and a day, make them hold it a little longer so we can get back into business they're in, making whatever product, providing whatever service they're in, it's time to stop the finance tail from wagging the economic dog and turn it back around the way it ought to be. If you do that, you still got to make sure everybody can be a part of this. First, it begins with education. No child's education should depend on the zip code that she or he grows up in. If you look at all the research from all the great school systems in all the world, not just America, and you realize we only get about eight cents on the dollar of education funding from the national government, Hillary believes we need fewer rules and more money invested in helping teachers be better teachers, principals be better principals and helping every school, every school to have a culture that works for the kids that it's educating. Then you got to deal with college and skills training. I think the one area where she spends a lot more money than her opponent in the primary is in kids that don't have to go to a four-year college if they've got the right skills training to get a good job, and we have undervalued that in our country. She wants to go back to it. She favors debt-free college for everybody. And this is a difference. Tuition-free sounds better, but it's not as good as debt-free for several reasons. One is the debt-free proposal requires the states to come up with a third of the money, and look at the trouble California's having right now. Most states can't do this. Secondly, you eliminate a lot of small private colleges that educate historically black colleges and universities, for example, educate a lot of Latinos, educate a lot of other first and second generation immigrants, and educate a lot of working class white Americans, too. Their kids, they should qualify. If you need free tuition, you get it. If you need more help, there'll be a big increase in the Pell Grants to give more help. If you can pay a little bit, you should. If you need more help, you get 10 hours a week of work study money, and that will hold down the cost of college. Everybody that can pay the full freight should pay it so you can use high income tax dollars to invest in the jobs of the 21st century that will lift our incomes together. What about the debt that's already been run up? This may be the most important thing of all for young people here and around the country. I don't know how many young people I've talked to who can't even move out of their parents' house because they can't make a rent payment and a debt payment. Anybody know anybody like that? Okay, so Hillary's plan to repay the debt already run up has three simple points. Number one, a college loan is the only loan that you cannot refinance. It doesn't make a lick of sense. If you just let everybody refinance the college loans, overnight, overnight, 19 million young Americans would save an average of $2,000 apiece. We ought to do that tomorrow. Second, then you should give everybody two choices to manage the debt they've got left. The average student debt in America is between $24,000 and $25,000. But people who go to medical school or go to architect school or whatever, they may owe up to $200,000. Depending on the tuition cost in a given state, it may be higher. I was just at Fresno State. They've got their average debt down to $18,000 but it's because of things they do there. So here are your choices. If you want to get rid of it, and it's around the average, if you do two years in AmeriCorps 
and then another year of any kind of public service work. You work in a drug treatment clinic or a social worker, a teacher, a, a police officer, a firefighter, any of that, any kind of public service work. In addition to your pay, you get $23,500 tax free to put against the debt and get rid of it. Now, if you, if you don't want to do that or you can't do it, you have another option. Turn your university debt into a home mortgage. What do I mean by that? You get a 20 or 30 year mortgage on a house because it's a lifetime asset. An education is more of a lifetime asset in this economy. So she would let everybody have the option of converting it into a 20-year mortgage with monthly payments, never, no matter how much you borrow, ever more than 10% of your after-tax income, and less if you owe less. Then what would happen? Think of that. First, you can move out of your parents' house. <laughs> Second, let's be serious. Second, suppose you've got a job you'd like to take, you'd really love to do. It pays less than the one you've got. You can take that job now because your loan payment will go down with your income. Suppose you always wanted to open your own business, a little coffee shop, a bookstore, a bakery. You're toast today. If you go to the bank, you've got no credit rating because of the debt. Now you would have. Why? Because the debt is fixed every month and goes down if your income goes down. So if you start a small business, you don't make any money for the first year or two, you don't owe anything on the debt. Now, you just think of this. If we did these simple things, three simple things, it would unleash the energies of millions of young Americans and help us all to rise together. What else would help? You want everybody in the workforce? We need comprehensive immigration reform. We need to quit paying politics with one of our greatest assets. Look around this room. We have the youngest, most diverse workforce of any big economy in the world. It's a gold mine for us. Stop acting like it's a hot potato and do the right thing by these young people and their families. And we can rise together. Second. Every state in the country needs to follow the lead of California, New York, New Jersey, and a handful of others, and recognize we have to get back to the top 10 countries in the world and women in the workforce, and that means paid leave, equal pay, and affordable child care. If you do that, yeah. Third, we have to recognize there are too many young people in prison for nonviolent offenses for too long. We need to let them out and let them go to work, but they have to be able to do it with education, training, job placement, and no discrimination in job interviews because they have once been incarcerated. If you do that, we can all rise together. Fourth, here's one you may not have thought of. The fastest growing consumer group in America are Americans with disabilities. They also have one of the most remarkable employment records. Always on time, never absent. Highly productive in things for which they are able to do and properly trained. And yet there is still too much discrimination against them in the application of jobs. Hillary wants to put Americans with disabilities where their abilities can help us all rise together. And now, even if you do all that, you have one problem, which is that areas that are really depressed will still not attract another, enough investment to let them go along for the ride. Poorest Americans still are Native Americans living on reservations where there are no casinos. The highest rate of, alcohol, of prescription drug and heroin abuse in America is in West Virginia, where Appalachia is collapsing, along with the price of coal. There are places in California that are being hurt today because of the water shortage yes. that face long-term uncertainty. There are sections of even the most prosperous American cities where crime is high, violence is rife, but economic opportunity is scarce. 
So what Hillary wants to do there is to give, first of all, a dedicated portion of all federal investment for economic initiatives to areas with an unemployment rate well above the national average and a long-term poverty rate above the national average, and then give big, clear, unambiguous tax credits for people who will invest in these areas that are left out and left behind so we can all go into the future together. Now, if you do that, if you do that, it will be a different world in the next few years. We can all rise together. And it's just a question of whether you believe that. There are a lot of people who believe that we are doomed to decades of low growth, and therefore that we have to play on the anger of people who feel left out and left behind and pick this group over that one. Promise to go back to a past that cannot be returned to and that wasn't so hot. If you were African American or Latino or female or a first generation immigrant or an Asian American, or if you come from my part of the country, even it wasn't so hot if you were Jewish. And one more thing on this. If we're all going forward together, we've got to all go forward together. If you don't believe in walls, you can't be for walls for anybody. I have been so proud of Hillary that she's been the most outspoken candidate in either party on a very simple issue. Who are we and who's part of our country? When, when President Obama asked her to be Secretary of State, she said, OK, but I'd like something from you. He said, what? He said, she said, I want two or three of those young tech geniuses you used to beat me in the primary. <laughs> and I want to put them to work on the social media to tell America's story around the world. Keep in mind, California endured our most recent terrorist incident in San Bernardino. Those people were converted over the social media. You can build all the walls you want. Across the Mexican border, across the Canadian border, sea walls in the Atlantic and Pacific. That only leaves the Gulf of Mexico open. We send the whole Navy down there and block everybody out. Send every plane the Air Force has up in the air to stop these people from coming in. You can't keep the social media out. And she said, we are making a big mistake by alienating American Muslims. We need people who love freedom and hate terror, who worship Islam, to be able to be part of our America so we can win this battle together. And so that's. My pitch is pretty straightforward. She got the best ideas. She's the only person with a record of breaking the partisan gridlock through the Children's Health Insurance Program, through an 80 percent increase in adoptions out of foster care when I was president, all with Republican support. When she was a senator, through helping New York City to recover for a decade or more, helping the first and second responders that got terrible, terrible illnesses, breathing all the stuff that was in the air helping small manufacturers and farmers, many of whom were not political or were Republicans, just so they could be part of a unified New York economy. When she ran for re-election as senator, the head of the Farm Bureau on Long Island endorsed her. Wow. And the press went breathlessly up to him and said, Joe, I thought you were a Republican. He said, I thought I was too. <laughs> well, how can you be for her? He said, look, I've been doing this a long time, just trying to help these farmers hold on to their land. It's hard out there. And all of our farmers are family farmers. And he said, all the politicians, they sound so good at election time. All I know is that after she got elected, she actually did something to help our farmers hang on to their land, and I am for her. Look, and the other thing is, if we break the gridlock, we can still be drugged down by all this trouble around the world. It's not just ISIS. It's Europe with the biggest refugee crisis in World War II. You can understand why they're scared. They got slow growth. Now they got a lot of refugees. You can understand why these people who are making the walls argument in Europe are making headway. Then you got our best trading partner, South America, 
burdened down with the biggest economy, Brazil, in trouble. You've got Africa with six of the fastest growing economies in the world and three virulent terrorist organizations. You've got Asia with China weak now. They give us trouble when they're weak and when they're strong. <laughs> threatening, threatening the Vietnamese and the Filipinos, two of our greatest allies, and other little countries there. There is no place that is free of difficulty. You can't fool with this. You need somebody who can keep us safe by keeping big, bad things from happening, make some good things happen, to give America the space to rise together so we can drag everybody else along with us to the 21st century. She is the only person who can do that. Look, we're coming to the end of a long campaign. It's been contentious. That's fine. Let's look at the big issues. These people voted together 93 percent of the time in the Senate. That's right. And when they didn't, I bet you won't surprise you, I agreed with her. <laughs> I think when she voted for immigration reform, yeah. she was right. Yeah. I think when she supports comprehensive background checks and gun safety measures yeah. to keep innocent kids from getting yeah. killed, she's right. Yeah. And look, I grew up in a hunting culture. I've heard all those speeches about Vermont and all that kind of stuff. I grew up in Arkansas. I had a 22 when I was 10. I had a 410 shotgun when I was 12. If you didn't go deer hunting once a year, they looked at you crossways, but I could never kill Bambi. We had to shut the high schools on the first day of deer season. Nobody's going to show up anyway. I did go duck hunting. I plead guilty. But nothing has ever been proposed that would deprive people of the legitimate right to hunt, to sport shoot, or if they live in rural areas and they're 30 or 40 minutes from law enforcement for being able to protect their families. This is a ruse designed to scare people, to blind them to the evident need to do basic, simple things on background checks and mental health checks to save the lives of innocent children in our community. So, I think she was right. But that's not why, entirely why, more than 90 percent of the people who serve with both these candidates have endorsed Hillary. It's not because they're all part of some vast establishment that's conspiring <laughs> against you. I mean, this establishment's pretty big now and includes the League of Conservation Voters, the Human Rights Campaign, uh, the, you know, the Planned Parenthood, the Congressional Black Caucus, two big Latino organizations, the United Farm Workers and lots of other unions, mostly the education unions. Yeah. You know, they did this for one reason, because they want someone who's not only right on the issues, but who's a change maker. We have been, it, it's awful what has been done to our political system through this gridlock. Yes. And I'm amazed that the President's been able to get as much done as he has. Yeah. But, and don't forget that you got some things you could do. They, these new overtime rules will raise income for 12 and a half million people just this last week. It's going to be a good thing. But these people endorsed her because they know her. And you shouldn't worry about this whooping the Republicans have been trying to put on her for the last four years. All the, a lot of the same people thought she was the greatest thing since sliced bread before that. But they have learned from being rewarded for their own misbehavior that they can smear people till the cows come home, and if all the smears are false, it'll still drive your numbers down. But be not afraid. We get a new shot when the general election starts. For the young people here who worry about this, I'll tell you a story. 24 years ago, I won the California primary. And wait, 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 wait. It was the end of a long, hard, contentious campaign. Early in the campaign, I mean early in New Hampshire, the Republicans came after me with all they were worth and told me they were going to. They said, we think you're different. You're the only one with a chance to win. We're going to take you out early. Because our friends back there, they love all this negative stuff. And you got to have sympathy with them because Heck, they got to put something new on every day. 
I mean, after all, doing good, improving lives, that's so boring. <laughs> We're laughing, but you know I'm telling you the truth. Right? So there's a story three weeks after the California primary in the San Francisco newspaper, where I'm going to spend the night tonight, in the San Francisco newspaper saying there's a hot race on between President Bush and Ross Perot. Clinton's not a factor. And there's a map in the paper saying I had nine electoral votes. <laughs> you forgot that, didn't you? It's about 370 short, that map. But why am I telling you this? Just relax. In the end, the American people are fundamentally fair-minded. They only have so much bandwidth to think about politics. Really. When I showed up at the convention, a majority of the American people didn't know that Hillary and I had a child and thought that we were both born with silver spoons in our mouth. They didn't know yeah, not in Hope, Arkansas, yeah. When in fact, I earnestly hope at least that I will be the last person elected president who ever lived on a little farm without indoor plumbing. The point is, you can't take all this stuff too seriously. You get to scrape the windshield clean after this. All you need to think about is the people that know her trust her and they believe in her. There's a reason all these members of Congress and all of these groups and the friends of her childhood and everybody in between. There's a reason in Arkansas where she has not lived in 18 years. She made only one stop and got two thirds of the vote because they trust her, they remember, they know. There's a reason, there's a reason that 93% of the African Americans in Alabama voted for her. They remember that those schools got shut down and they know that. All will be well if California will show up, shout out, and send her to that convention with a win of the vote. God bless you.